in my day, there was a 30-day suspension for any boxer, and this is in New York State, that um, was either knocked out or took a severe beating. Now I believe it's 90 days. Well, I don't see the NFL implementing that rule for anybody that gets a concussion. And we're going way back to the early 60s. And many of these rules and regulations, the testing that they had for boxers, the same test that I failed at that time was an electrocephalogram. Now, you know, I failed that exam, and, but it was there to protect me. So I think boxing, uh, they, they, a lot of these sports could learn a lot from boxing and the, and the former gladiators. You know, I could not tell you how many I had and there's a reason. We didn't know what we were counting. You have to know what you're counting to count. And you know, everybody had that misconception you had to get knocked out. I never been knocked out. So I just we just didn't know. And I believe those times when I was getting days, concussions. To put a count on them, we just didn't know. We just didn't know what was going on.
what uh, some of the things that it, some of the things that it does is objective balance <laughs> testing has yeah, done uh, preseason neuropsych evaluations are done so that after they sustain the concussion and then when they say they recover, you test them again to see if they're back to the baseline. So that's one of the objective measures. That you use. Now, obviously, most people know we do a neuro exam for the most part, except for the cognitive and neuropsych aspect. Is balance a very sensitive indicator of persistent? Yeah, it's a, it's a sensitive indicator, but probably just within the first three days. Okay. After the first three days, it's not valid. Yeah, yeah, one thing. Um, when it comes to high school or youth league athletes or youth college, that's where my job will never be obsolete because I'm there to get them to the help, to convince them this is not the right move. And it usually does resonate. So my job will never be obsolete, and I believe education, education will convince them or at least plant the seed and make them think twice before they challenge those symptoms. Uh, I would make the point that that education is much more valuable coming from a committed elite athlete than it is from an educator, a parent, a teacher. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, so you we haven't seen it in boxing. Uh, there's been some other cases with my study that has demonstrated that. Uh, we've seen progressive changes over a period of time. Like, for example, uh, development of a cave receptor hallucinum over a period of time. Cave receptor hallucinum is basically between the lateral ventricles, there's two membranes from repetitive trauma. The membranes become fenestrated and CSF leaks into between the membranes and sort of form like a moment. They call it a fifth ventricle. We've seen that over the time of uh, developing boxes. I haven't seen things reversed. Seems like evidence has shown like repeated abuse of smaller blows to the ball leads to concussion type symptoms. Is there any evidence that can head here like prevent concussions? Well, head gear doesn't uh, prevent concussions in boxing or in football. There's no concussion proof helmet. Uh, the mechanism of concussion is rotational acceleration, so the head will rotate the box if you have the helmet on or not. The helmet or head gear will protect against more severe brain injuries, and in particular, uh, prevent against skull fractures. Uh, so, and so there is a role for helmets in sports, but it doesn't prevent the concussion. That's a big debate. Why don't you want to mention what did you uh, experience first in terms of behavior versus headaches versus cognitive issues? The cognitive issues with behavioral problems with me and uh, an ability, the frustration from being a very high honor student where I could pick up, I could read one page and remember that forever. And I didn't even have to take books home. I could remember the, the teachers, whatever they taught in class, I could remember they had a great ability to retain information. And after that second concussion within one week, that frustration of what was going on, and it was, I, could, I needed help. And there was nobody to turn to. That's why it's so important to get that help. And I then the depression because everything was falling apart and I just couldn't explain why. We just didn't understand it back then. And you know, teachers were rendering different um, like an I don't know how to explain it, analysis on me that that was so frustrating because I, I knew that wasn't true. I was trying my hardest. Uh, yeah, depression is that's a big one and that's the one you want to look for. If you, and um, concussion awareness uh, symptoms. That's a big one. Behaviorally, it can be difficult to detect an athlete uh, simply because you don't know that athlete very well, you might not know 
with the behavioral change. Uh, and just my experience with boxing, boxing tend to be very unique to me. You know, sometimes it may be difficult to know uh, what's pre-existing or uh, what's new. Uh, there seems to be two presentations, though, what they call the chronic traumatic encephalopathy. There may be a behavioral presentation, which seems to start in a younger group, and then there's a more cognitive presentation that probably starts in older individuals, where uh, dementia is probably more prevalent. So there still is a lot uh, unknown about this position. I was wondering if I could ask questions of the boxing commission. Is, uh, what, is there been any discussion from the commission and the state legislature about you know, sanctioning a sport where you have to get on the stand on uh, neuropsychological testing before you participate? <laughs> I mean, it just seems like boxers, because of the history of boxing, that people who go into boxing at one age because they might tend to be from more than five socioeconomic groups, might be much more susceptible. And, um, I don't think it has anything to do with the socioeconomic I just wanted to know if you could maybe go through a little bit more detail about how the race program going to work for the kind of launch today. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, we have some seed money from the hospital. And uh, basically, we sort of started already where we evaluate uh, athletes. And uh, some of the athletes I've, I've been seeing free. Uh, we've been collaborating with other institutions where we've been able to get our imaging done uh, free. Um, Institutions include Mount Sinai, Columbia, Cornell, uh, Electrical Health Imaging uh, Center in Connecticut. So we've worked with all of these groups to try and uh, provide care for these athletes. Uh, and then Uh, obviously, 
in boxes, sparring in the gym, there's no physician care. Uh, in football, on a professional level, there's athletic trainers there. On a college level, there's athletic trainers there. In high school, it's 50-50 uh, whether you have athletic training or not. And whether they have an athletic trainer available is depending upon the resources of that school district. Uh, athletic trainers are pretty well trained in uh, doctor uh, evaluating athletes for concussion and recognizing concussion. I think it, the education part is just so important. Uh, as, as Ray mentioned, there was this belief you had to be, have, be knocked unconscious to have a concussion. And in sports, less than 10% of the concussions are associated with the level of consciousness. So 90% of them, you know what I'm saying? That's why people say this is a visible, visible injury. I think uh, education is, is so important so you know what symptoms to look for, and so that you don't return while you're still symptomatic. And uh, one of the biggest problems I've come across with athletes, often they don't want to tell you they, they sustained a concussion because they're concerned about losing their position on the team, if they say, say in football. And uh, I tell the athlete, I said, well, look, if you have a concussion and you continue to play, not only will it result in that concussion probably lasting longer, but you might not be able to play that well with the concussion. And in fact, you could still lose your, your position because you had the concussion. And I was evaluating one uh, NFL player not too long ago, and he was telling me how uh, all his teammates were laughing at him eventually, but they were saying that, uh, but he told me that uh, he continued to play while he had a concussion, and he caused his team to lose the playoffs. This is, this is an NFL one. So losing the playoffs in the NFL is not a small thing. But he, he was knowledgeable of that. He was missing his assignments when he was playing. So that's one of the things I tell the athletes, and sometimes that may convince them to want to uh, be truthful about their symptoms. It's going to be primarily outpatient. And it's going to be similar to, the procedure is going to be very similar to how we uh, run our memory evaluation treatment service. Uh, unlike the typical evaluation for a concussion, this is the type of workup someone might receive if they have a memory disorder. So if, say someone thinks they have Alzheimer's disease, they come to our memory evaluation treatment service. That's the type of workup these athletes will have. Because uh, in concussion, most of the time, you don't need a detailed evaluation. Most of them get better within seven to 10 days. It doesn't require any neural energy. But if someone is a retired athlete and they have cognitive problems, it requires a, a major work. You need neural energy, you need blood work to rule out a reversible causes of dementia, you need neuropsychological testing. So it's a very elaborate workup. And often, a lot of these athletes, when they retire, they don't have the funds. And I think that's that's the strong uh, suit in our, in our program. Hopefully, we'll get contributions from different organizations to keep this sustainable. Most of the programs in the country, uh, there's one in Boston, there's one in North Carolina, uh, they're based mostly on research funds. So they're not, they're not providing care uh, of the goodness of their heart. It's, 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 uh, it's actually part of a research protocol. So anyone that comes to our center, they don't have to be part of a research protocol, uh, they can be evaluated. Um, amateur uh, is not as tightly regulated, um, and basically to box uh, as an amateur, you just have to, you, once you sign up, you can get examined before the, the night of the fight. Uh, it's not no more imaging, no blood work or anything. Could you address one more question? It's always asked at most every um, speaking engagement is how many concussions are too many? Yeah, I don't think anyone really knows that answer. Uh, the magic number everyone talks about is three, but I think it's, it's the difference between an athlete that sustains three concussions, say, in one year versus an athlete that sustains three concussions over a period of five or six years. So I think it depends on the time between the concussions. 
and the duration of time that it requires to recover them. Right. Okay. Ray. Ray, you want to give him the gloves? Thank you. 